My name is Steve McCaw. I'm a retired professor from Illinois State University in Normal. What I'm going to talk about today is the biomechanics of running. I'm going to primarily focus on how the act of running loads the body, the response of the body, and how different forms of running lead to training and to injuries in runners. Today's speaker is Dr. Stephen McCaw, Professor Emeritus of Biomechanics at Illinois State University, where he was a professor for 25 years. He's published dozens of scientific papers on biomechanics, and his book, titled Biomechanics for Dummies, was released earlier this year. Running is a very familiar motion for most of us, especially for people in today's triathlon. Um, but when we look at what's going on more closely, it becomes vastly more complicated. Uh, as a scientist, Dr. McCaw has spent his career unraveling these complexities of biomechanics, and he's here today to teach us more about running than we ever knew existed. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Stephen McCaw. Thanks, Chris. Good morning. I was very honored and flattered to be invited to speak to uh, CTUST. Um, I think it's a tremendous idea of sharing scientific knowledge with people and keeping people, people's interests up in it. Uh, what I want to do today is briefly I'll give you a quick idea of who I am. Chris mentioned most of the high points. Uh, then talk a little bit about running as a popular activity and then get into biomechanics, describe what it is, the kinematics and kinetics that we study, and then look at this specifically as it relates to uh, running itself, with particular emphasis on the idea of load during running, of how much stress is imposed on the body, because this is related both to the training of the body that occurs and also to the uh, predisposition to injuries, which are all too frequent in runners. Then I also want to spend a little bit of time looking at a comparison of rear foot versus midfoot running, um, looking at GRFs, ground reaction forces, a little bit on joint loads and a comparison of the movement patterns. And then finally, just as I finish up, talk a little bit about the uh, ru cycling, running to cycling transition that occurs in a triathlon. So briefly, who I am, I've been a frequent, infrequent runner since 1977, do it for Relax out, relaxation for the health and the fitness benefits that come from it. Uh, as Chris mentioned, I received my PhD in biomechanics in uh, 1989 from the University of Oregon. In my four years at the U of O, I was a research assistant in the running lab in the biomechanics sports medicine uh, department. Uh, I start, started at Illinois State University in 1989, and after 25 years, I just retired this past spring, so this is my first big academic activity since retirement. Um, over the 25 years that I was at ISU and my time at Oregon, we studied energy absorption, a generic idea of how the body protects itself when it contacts the ground or anything else. These uh, concepts are important both in physical activity and I also do a lot of this in legal cases as it relates to people's falling and uh, b being injured in car accidents or some, for example, fall off a ladder. So running's popularity, if we go back to before the 1960s, running was part of some sport and some games. Uh, it was obviously part of track and field events. It was, for most people, some form of gym clash punt gym class punishment, go out and do a few laps if you were, were misbehaving in class. That was probably my first exposure to, to any terms of endurance running. And it was very popular among what were considered to be eccentric people. It was not uncommon if somebody was seen at 6 a.m. running around in shorts and a t-shirt that they would be stopped as under some sort of suspicious activity. That started to change though in the uh, 1960s and one of the leaders behind this idea was uh, this fellow, Bill Bowerman, he was the track coach at the University of Oregon who produced many uh, Olympic runners. He took the Oregon team down to New Zealand in 1962 and he was very impressed with the popular culture of jogging among the general population. And when he returned to Oregon, he wrote this book uh, that was simply titled Jogging. It was really the first exposure of the American public to the idea of jogging. Bowerman also was a co-founder of Nike, and he was the person responsible for the development of the waffle sole 
and the uh, widespread use of specific running shoes. Another very important individual in the development of running was Dr. Ken Cooper. He was a cardiologist with the United States Air Force. Dr. Cooper was quite appalled at the uh, fitness level of recruits coming into the Air Force, and he was also tasked with maintaining the cardiovascular health of individuals in the Air Force. He was responsible for coming up with the program that he published in the, in the book called, titled Aerobics, which popularizes the idea of the cardiovascular benefits uh, that come from being fit. And he turned a lot of his profits, both from his uh, private medical practice once he got out of the Air Force and his book, into founding the Cooper Clinic in Dallas, which is a uh, major uh, sponsor of research on the benefits of running. Runner's World Magazine came out, depending on its title, in 60, 1966 or 1968. This was initially directed at those eccentric people who ran, but they were very quickly to jump on the popularization bandwagon and became pretty well the voice or bible of, of uh, running and spreading the word and popularizing different techniques. Some of the athletes who were responsible for the popularity of running, uh, probably the first runner that I became aware of was Jim Ryan, who as a high schooler was, uh, broke the four minute mile. Uh, that was quite an incredible feat when he did that back in 1965. His record for the mile stood for 36 years and uh, Jim Ryan still holds, even though he's a retired congressman, he still holds five of the six fastest high school mile times in history. Uh, this individual, K.V. Switzer, her real name Kathy Switzer, put her up there by her initials because she was the first female to register for the Boston Marathon, in spite of the fact that it was illegal for women to run in the Boston Marathon at the time. That's why she used her initials. And this picture shows the uh, head of the Boston Athletic Commission trying to physically remove her from the race. And uh, she continued on and finished it. So she um, claimed notoriety. Then with some success of American Olympians, uh, especially Frank Shorter in 1972, just as the boom was growing in the United States, uh, Frank won the gold medal in the Olympic marathon in 1972 in Munich. And then he also uh, received a silver medal in the 1976 Montreal Olympics. One of the biggest uh, People influencing the boon in running was uh, the fellow in the lead here, leading Frank Shorter in a race, Steve Perfontaine, who uh, died in 1975 following actually this race at, at Hayward Field in, in Eugene. He was the all -American, uh, the American record holder in almost every middle distance that was uh, used in the early, uh, in the mid 1970s. And he made it hip and cool to be a, a runner then running really exploded with Bill Rogers' success in the marathon. He uh, was the American record holder in the marathon for many years, and he dominated both the, uh, the, both the Boston and the New York marathon uh, through the late 1970s. And then the uh, final person I'll acknowledge here was Joan Benoit, as she was known at the time. time. She won the uh, first Olympic marathon for women in 1984 in Los Angeles. So. Those are some of the people that brought running popularity to the forefront. For our success in running, we can sort of break it down into three areas. And these are three areas that people in our department tend to study. There's basically your fitness level. Most of the focus is on cardiovascular health, your strength, flexibility, and body composition. Much of this, of course, is determined by your genetics. Uh, you can sort of tell how great a runner you're going to be and what your ultimate possibility is based on your genetic potential. You can train to come close to that, but everybody has a genetic limit that's going to affect them. The second factor is psychology. And here, and here we can throw in your motivation. What is your willingness to put in the time and the effort? And as I'll allude to later, your willingness to go through the pain that comes with extreme running. And then the third factor of running success is to remain obviously injury free. If you're, not, if you're injured, by definition, you're not able to run. And so your um, ability to remain injury free relates to three things. What type of loading you're exposed to, the stress that your body gets 
imposed on it while you're being physically active, what your body's tolerance is and how that can adapt. And then the third factor, of course, is rest. For the training effect to take place, you need to provide your body with the rest for the remodeling, for those beneficial changes that your musculoskeletal system, cardiovascular system, everything related to fitness to improve. So there's a big running continuum, and I was invited to talk here. Uh, Andrea told me that there'd be a wide variety of people here, so I thought I'd sort of address this. Running interest is a continuum. It goes from the low end where you can sort of say that it's non-existent. These are among the people who like their sofa, their beer, and their remote, and they're not necessarily even interested in becoming physically active. And it stretches all the way out here to the end where there's people who are addicted to running, who feel emotionally lost if they don't get in there fixed amount of training daily or weekly. And then there's the broad mass of us within the middle here. There's a group down here who have moved away from being non-existent interests. They want to run, but they just can't get themselves started. And in many cases, it's the perception of what they have to do that prevents them from doing that. Then you get into the regular runners. There's people like me who are easily diverted from running, go off with some other physical activity, but then there's other people who are very consistent. They don't like to miss a session. They schedule their day around it so that they get in their physical activity. Which, I'll just briefly address this question of, of how much activity and exercise do we, need, do we need. And there's a big misconception that activity or exercise is only good if the intensity or the volume is high. So this is basically geared towards those who are down at the non-existent or, or who, who are interested but can't get started. We tend to confuse fitness and health. They're two separate things. Health is freedom from disease. Fitness is your ability to do something physical that you want to do. Uh, we see this admonition. I took these off some websites of running the constant. Pain is weakness leaving the body. Sore body is a strong body tomorrow. That's all true, but that's not necessary. And let's go to some research that came out of the Cooper Clinic, just to emphasize this. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. What we've got here is estimated death rate for many cause relating people's body mass index, a measure of their uh, obesity level, and their physical activity. So along the vertical axis here, we have the hazard ratio of people's risk of death. And we can set that at one as our reference. These are obese individuals who are not physically active. And what the Cooper Clinic has been leading on is taking people's activity levels and looking at the least active people, the more active people, and the middle active people, and comparing the health benefits of being physically active. So here's our referent of the obese, non-active people. What I've circled here shows if you get these people from doing nothing, to just getting up and doing the basic fundamentals of being physically active, you can see that there's about a 20% risk, a 20% drop in their risk of dying. If we, if we look at the groups of individuals who are overweight and their normal weight, we can see that the benefits that you get from being in the most active group, this purple bar, is not nearly as great an increase as you see a drop just getting people who do nothing to start doing something. And in fact, you start seeing that there's not really any difference between people who would be classified as overweight versus people who are over normal weight. It's the physically act physical activity that's important. So we're constantly being bombarded <coughs> excuse me, with the statement that obesity is a health problem. And the reality of it is, if you go to the data that's been generated by the Cooper Clinic, by the Harvard Health Studies that, that have been conducted over 30 years, that's not really true. What our problem is, is that we have a single problem that's physical inactivity. If we can move people from doing nothing, whether you're overweight, whether you're obese, you get the health benefits of the physical activity. So the bottom line is we don't nearly need as much activity as we, want, as we think we do to get the health benefits from it. But your fitness is a separate thing. So let's talk a little bit about biomechanics. Um, Biomechanics is the science, or mechanics itself is the science that's concerned with the forces, pushes and pulls, that act on and within a body and the effect that these forces have on that body. And there's two main things that we forces tend to do. One is that they cause motion. In reality is they 
tend to change motion. They speed things up or they slow things down. A second area that we look at is deformation or strain, the change in the shape of a body when a force is imposed. In reality, a deformation is really just a small um, form of, of motion itself. And the reason, <coughs> excuse me, the reason we look at these two, th um, look at biomechanics is one, to understand performance and to understand technique, what it is that the body does how it produces the forces and interacts with the forces exerted on it, just to get a better understanding of movement that can be used in rehabilitation and in, in training. And then we also look at the effects of these forces, specifically the st strain and deformation on injury and changing and, and training the physical adaptations that occur to the body. <clears throat> Mechanics then, we, we take two approaches as we study it. One is what's known as kinematics, and the other one is what's known as kinetics. Kinematics is simply the description of motion. When you watch a runner, you go, that person has good form, that person is fast. Whoa, if you're, if you're in stand back, well, that's an that's a awesome performance from that person. You're doing a fundamentally a kinematic analysis, an eyeball evaluation of what you see happening. Kinetics, on the other hand, this is the far underutilized area of mechanics. Kinetics is, is focused in on the forces, the pushes and pulls that act on a body that cause the motion. And I emphasize causing here because well, we have a, a lot of assumed cause and effect relationships. Your mother said to you, oh, if you go outside without your coat, you're going to catch a cold. If you do this, this is going to happen. Very few of those are true. One of the few cause-effect relationships that we know of is if you impose an uh, if you impose an imbalanced force on a body, it will cause a change in that body's motion. The bio relates to the living body that we're focused on. So we focus in on the nerves, the muscles, and the bone. We look at the load, how the load, how these tissues respond to the load, and how they adapt when load is imposed on them. <coughs> and it's a pretty widely applicable area. These are two of my favorite articles out of the history of the Journal of Biomechanics. One is Gait Analysis of Poultry, where the biomechanics of chickens is studied, and the other one is the biomechanics of fruits and vegetables, because fruits and vegetables get injured. If you go to the supermarket and your tomatoes are bruised, if your apples have blemishes on them, you don't want to buy them. So farmers and other agricultural producers are interested, what can we do to these apples how can we change the loading? How can we change how they're stored, how they're shipped so they don't get damaged? Or what they tend to have done is how... Wow. How can we breed these things? How can we genetically modify them so that they don't bruise as easily? So it's really the same thing. You take a biological living material and the principles are all the same. It also focuses in on anthropometrics, which is the study of the body size and form. We like to think uh, Leonardo da Vinci was one of the first biomechanists because with his famous Vesuvian, Vesuvian man, he outlined laid the relationship between the length of various body segments and the entire human body. And much of his uh, insight into these anthropometrics of the body changed how artists approach uh, their drawing. So how do we evaluate kinematics and kinetics? As I said, one way we can do it is simply with our naked eye. When you watch the Olympics and you see the performances, you're doing a basic kinematic, kinematic analysis. This is especially prevalent when you get into the subjective aspect of gymnastics and figure skating, where how do you determine whose performance is better? A simple way you can do it is with your stopwatch and tape measure. When you measure splits when somebody is training, uh, when you measure the length of people's steps, you're doing a, fun, a fundamentally a kinematic analysis. Uh, you can use video to facilitate it if you've ever recorded yourself and watch, or somebody else is recording you and you watch yourself run to get insights into what you're doing. Here's one of the most earliest kinematic studies by Edward Moybridge, actually one of the uh, arguably an inventor of moving pictures. Leland Stanford, who after whom Stanford University is named, had racehorses. And then back in the late 1800s, there was a question of when a racehorse runs, is there ever an instance when all four legs are off the ground? 
horse's legs move so quick you can't see it. So Moybridge invented this ingenious system of um, triggered cameras that he set up along the track and they got the horse to run. And when you play it back, he invented what he called the Zool Praxiscope and made himself, uh, made himself a rich man traveling around Europe and in North America showing these pictures. And sure enough, it demonstrates that during the flight, this ton and a half animal is completely airborne. I, the anecdote is that Stanford won the bet from that. When we get to running research in biomechanics, much of what we understand about the biomechanics of running, we can owe to these three scientists, Dr. Barry Bates from Oregon, Dr. Peter Cavanaugh, who was at Penn State when he started, and Dr. Ben Oneg at the University of Calgary. Much of the research that's available on running in biomechanics comes from labs that were directed by either these three individuals or by labs that have been developed and directed by individuals that trained or labs that were developed by individuals that trained under people who were trained by these three. So these are really the, the grandfathers or great grandfathers of biomechanics research. A typical biomechanics lab, they're pretty high tech, fancy industries that changed dramatically over the 25 years that I was associated with them. A modern lab now consists of motion capture cameras that track infrared markers, a big open space where the activity can be performed, or it can be done if you're studying running or walking or some other form of gait on a treadmill. The basic instrumentation behind it is you take a, a subject and you attach light reflective markers onto various prominence prominences of the body. This is essentially the same technology that's used to create uh, computer animation in movies or to create uh, video games. We use that, the once that's recorded, we have a, a recording of the person's movement. We can measure external forces with an instrument that's known as a force platform. The force platform is, as shown here, it can get mounted in the floor or they can be installed under a treadmill. So these give us measures of the forces that are being applied under the foot of somebody while they locomote, whether it's walking, running, or jumping. And with the markers, we can track them. So here's sort of an example of what happens to an individual with markers attached to their body running over the force platform. Uh, we don't need a great image because we use computer software to track the uh, the markers giving us XY coordinates and we can store that into a computer. This is a very, very high wow factor. If you watch any um, television shows when they're talking about biomechanics, they always show these multicolored stick people that have been segmented. You see the individual dots representing this individual. They very good wow factor as they show these. It's got a good wow factor, but it doesn't have very much uh, scientific or even clinical application until you start breaking down the movement of what the person's doing. When we get into the kinematics, the first thing we start off with, of course, is the position of the body. We get that from the markers and properly processing that. And then with a recording of the person as they perform it, we can measure distances and displacement, how far they're traveling or in frame to frame in very, very brief periods of time. We can calculate how fast they're traveling or individual segments are moving. And we can also get into the consistency of whether these segments or body portions are speeding up or slowing down a measure of their acceleration. So let's look at the fundamentals of, of, of running and Hopefully that looks to you like it looks to me of here's an individual, they're coming through, they're landing on their left leg, they're planted on their left leg, then they go into their next flight phase, land on their right foot, and then they push off from their right foot. The one of the fundamental uh, units of, of running is the stride, and the stride, as this shows, goes from, in this case, the takeoff of the right foot until the subsequent takeoff of the right foot. Steps are half parts of these. We can see a right step, which begins when the person's right foot comes off of the ground, and it continues through until when their left foot comes off of the ground, and they start into a left step. So a single stride consists of repeating right steps and left steps, or left steps and right steps, whichever way you want to look at it. And we measure these. We can measure 
the uh, number of steps that somebody performs in a second, and we can measure their stride length. How far the body displays this during the stride, the center of gravity, which is the same as the distance that their foot travels, or we can look at the distance over a step, whether it's right or left. So the fundamental idea behind running speed is that it's a product of stride rate times stride length. That's one of the reasons why a tape measure and a stopwatch can be used for fundamental um, kinematic analysis. And multiple years of research going way back, is how, what happens is we change our speed. So here's a graph that shows stride length and strides per second along the vertical and people's running speed across the horizontal axis going from uh, slow speed to fast speed and then stride length across the vertical. And what we can see, stride length is these dark circles, stride rate is the low circles. As you move from a slow speed to a fast speed, we do that first by increasing the length of our stride. We, take, we cover more distance with each step. The increase in stride length is much faster than the increase in stride rate. But eventually you get to a point where our stride length can't increase that much more. And any further increases occur because of increases in the stride rate. You're moving your legs faster and faster. And that's an interesting description and you'll st still see a lot of um, writers refer to this. And That particular one, the internet. Or I, I took the data and put okay. it in. Okay. The problem with this is if we look at what the role of the leg in locomotion is, any form of gait, what we ask this amazing physical specimen to do, one is we want it to absorb energy. When somebody's running, when you're running and you're coming down towards the ground, you're moving fast forward, you're moving fast downward, you've got a lot of kinetic energy and your body has to be brought to rest. We want our leg to serve as a shock absorber, to absorb that energy. It then needs to provide a support as we rotate over top of that leg to getting prepared for the next propulsion phase. And then we call on that same leg that acted as the energy absorber to produce the energy to push us off into the next step. So a common way of analyzing how our leg works is to look at it as if it's a spring. And here's an example of somebody running when their foot contacts the ground and this spring compresses down. It's serving as a shock absorber. It provides a support, the spring as we rotate over top. And then it generates energy as it pushes us off. And we can look at the role of the ankle, the knee, and the hip as how they contribute to this overall spring action of the leg. And that's, this is important in terms of understanding the loading to the body. In a kinematic analysis, after we've recorded somebody with their markers, we can then look at the joint actions that occur at the hip and the knee and the ankle joint. And what the data show, looking here at the hip, here's from ground contact to uh, the end of takeoff when you push into the next phase, we can see that there's flexion and extension, both a decrease and an increase in the joint angle that occurs at each of the joints. And that's all well and good. And there's a great deal of focus on the kinematics. But the problem with a kinematic analysis is that it's simply a description of what's happening. It's not telling us why these motions are occurring. As an example of this, they tell people when they're running to lift your leg up high when you won't run fast, that you want to bring your leg up and you'll see tr people out training. I would watch the ISU track team out and they're running down the track doing this practice because we know that good runners have a lot of range of motion and they bring their heel up close to their butt during the recovery. But there's no focus on why does that occur. And that brings us to the kinetics of running. I'm not going to get into why we bring our heel up close to our butt when we run, but just to focus on, on the idea of looking at the forces that are exerted on the body. When we're looking at a runner, or we're looking at anything, the one force that we have to deal with is our own body weight, the constant pull of gravity trying to pull us down towards the center of the earth. There's air resistance that you encounter if you're running on a windy day. It makes it harder to run than if it's 
a non-windy day. But we're going to, I'm going to primarily focus in on these ground reaction forces, which consist of the friction forces forward and backwards and side to side under your foot, and what we would call a normal or vertical ground reaction force, the force that's pushing up that we're manipulating to deal with our interaction with the ground. Then from there, I'm going to talk a little bit about the internal forces on a runner. These are all the pushes and pulls within the body, especially as they relate to the muscles that pull on our segments to cause them to rotate. And at the same time that they're pulling to cause and control the rotation at joints, they're pulling on their insertion sites onto bones. That's a very um, common cause of many running related injuries. Let's start off looking at these ground reaction forces in somebody, a rear foot lander. A rear foot lander is somebody who lands, tends to land on the lateral outside portion of their heel as they're running. Uh, this is just the tracing taken from the force platform that's mounted in the, uh, in the treadmill. And we see that it very rapidly rises up. And it gets up to a magnitude of... Oh, So here, here's the, uh, a still of that photo. We have our force measured in units of body weight along the vertical axis, and I put the marker for the individual's body weight in here once, and then their time of running. One of the things that you notice here is that the ground contact time is extremely short. It's measured in milliseconds. A quarter to a second, quarter of a second is about the time that your foot is on the ground and we're asking it to do an awful lot of things during that brief interval of time. One of the main features, what do people see as the main feature on these curves? It's kind of a hint here. This little spike that shows up here. That's known as the impact transient. Some people refer to it as the um, passive force. Some people refer to it as F1. It's characterized, and this was the focus of attention when people first had access to force platforms, because you can see that this force goes way up. It gets close to, even at this relatively slow speed, over two times your body weight. And it reaches that in a very, very brief period of time, about 20 milliseconds. This represents what was called an impulse of load. If somebody in a factory was exposed to this, you know that the Occupational Safety and Health Administration would be telling people, you can't expose people to this type of loading. It's just not right. And that loading that gets up over top of your body weight in a very brief period of time, this is, this is of critical importance because if we look at the number of steps, and I'm saying, I'm just estimating here that somebody's doing a four foot step per mile. The number of steps along the vertical, the number of miles across the horizontal, and starting off with one mile, see that we take about 1,300 steps. That's 650 contacts between the, left, between the left foot and the right foot with the ground for each mile that somebody runs. So we've got an awful lot of repeated loading that we show gets very, very high very, very quickly. And what's very interesting is that this force varies from step to step. What we tend to think of running is simply one foot after another, the right foot and then the left foot. If we look at these curves, one from a, uh, from a left step and then one from a right step, we see that that impact transient varies in magnitude. The curves are not exactly the same. So we've got this force that reaches a high magnitude in a short period of time, and it's not precisely the same from time to time. So how does our body, body deal with this? And the importance of this comes if we look at how this gets transmitted up the body. If you've ever been walking down the street and you've inadvertently stepped off of a curb, or you've taken a misstep, and it will jolt you. You have so much kinetic energy. We take it for granted how well our body can absorb the energy. But if you ever take a misstep, that jolt will go right up and it will shake, shake your head. The higher you come from, the bigger that bump. So that can be measured in a lab. If we put, have somebody run on a force platform and we put a little sensor onto their the little prominence in the front of their knee, their tibial tuberosity, and we can even mount one up here on the head in this rudimentary thing just mounted on a block of wood or you can attach it to the person's skull. There's our ground reaction force and you can see that impact transient. And you can see traces of this that show up 
just below the knee joint. The load gets transferred up the body. And you can even see a res residual of this that makes it all the way up to the head. It's reduced in magnitude. The leg is serving as an energy absorber. It's reducing the magnitude of this load that's opposed at the feet as it transfers up to the head. And it's that absorbing of the energy that is one of the primary factors related to the beneficial and the negative effects of being physically active. If we look at what happens to ground reaction forces as people increase speed, and this slide may take a little bit of getting used to. Here we have time across the horizontal, so there's our familiar trace with the impact transient. And we have different running speeds along this axis, and we have vertical ground reaction forces that are recorded at different speeds. As you run faster, you have greater step rate. You have a greater step rate because your foot is in contact with the ground a shorter period of time, and you can see that decrease in time to where it's down here to about 20 milliseconds. At the same time as the time that your foot's in contact with the ground is getting shorter, the magnitude of that force under the, that the ground is imposing on your foot is getting taller. So we've got a larger force imposed in a shorter period of time that the body's got to deal with. That's a tremendous demand. As fancy as we've seen robots on television and man-made things, there's nothing that is as good at dealing with these forces or creating these forces as is the human machine. If we look at what comes off of the sensors as somebody, that doesn't look that spot. If we look at the impact attenuation, here's a recording of the magnitude of the force that shows up at somebody's knee as they go from 50% of their maximum speed to 100% of their maximum speed. And you can see that as you go faster, the magnitude of the load that gets transferred up the leg gets larger and larger. But if we look here at the sensor that's mounted up at the head, you can see that there's not nearly as much of an increase in the magnitude of the load. Regardless of the speed at which we're running, that impact load, that impact transient from contact, about 94% of that gets absorbed by the body as it moves up towards the head. Which raises the question, how do we absorb energy? What do we do with this leg? We don't have a passive spring. We have this vast complex of nerves and muscles and bones that serve to absorb energy. Our best way of absorbing energy is what we refer to as eccentric muscle activity. Eccentric muscle activity means that a muscle is developing tension as it gets longer. You're probably all familiar with this in terms of giving. If I come down and I land, you see flexion that's occurring at my knees, my hips, and my ankles. And the muscles on the back of those joints in the front of my knee and hip, they're getting longer. They're developing tension. They're preventing me from completely collapsing. That's eccentric activity. The muscle's acting very much as a spring does. It's producing a force that resists the collapse of the joint. And because of the way that our muscles are made, they can store a lot of that mechanical energy in, a, in, in, a, in the deformation of the materials within it. If we look back at our data from the kinematic analysis, and we can see this occurring. And somebody, when they're running, looking at their hip, their knee, and their ankle, you see very early after the initial contact with the ground, you see a little bit of flexion at the hip joint, a little bit of give. You see much more flexion that occurs at the knee joint as it bends underneath it. And you see a great deal more dorsiflexion occurring at the ankle, the bending of the ankle as it comes up towards your foot. And this is all eccentrically controlled. There is a primary source of energy absorption when we are running. Curves look very similar when you're walking or when you're landing. We see this flexion occurs initially after contact. And this brings us to some important muscles. We'll just focus in on some at the ankle joint. If you look at the muscles here, this is the uh, can't say it's a person. It's a, you look at the you can't say it's a healthy person. Uh, you look at the lateral, the front outside of their leg, and we have, I've starred three muscles, the tibialis anterior, which many of you have been running for a long time and you've developed pain down in your shin. You've probably been told it has something to do with your tibialis anterior. 
and then these other muscles, the extensor digitorum and the extensor hallucis. These muscles all attach up here on the lateral outside portion of your shank or your lower leg, and they have long tendons that pass down in front of your ankle joint and attach onto the top surface of your foot. We'll come back to the relevance of these later on. If we look at the back of your leg, you have two distinguishing muscles, the gastrocnemius and the soleus. These are the two muscles that give the shapely outline to a runner's calves, and they come down and join, him, join together into the Achilles tendon and attach on the heel behind the ankle joint. A second way that energy is absorbed is what we refer to as bone microfracture. We tend to think of bones as these hard, resistant materials, but what happens is as energy is transmitted up the bone, the structure of the bone, which consists of a hard outer shell, this being the uh, thigh bone, and then all of this spongy bone or trabecular bone that's fitted at the ends of the bones to give us lightness and allow us to move. When a load is imposed on the bone, we don't necessarily, you can have a fracture that is an obvious break, but the micro here refers to very, very small fractures. As the bone is deformed because of this loading, some of the bone structure gives way at a microscopic level, level. And it's all part of the potentially beneficial effects of loading. So these little micro fractures that occur, that absorbs some of the energy and protects more from being sent up where it will shake our all important brain. And our bones really, they're not just haphazardly put together. And I've always enjoyed this picture here that shows that same bone and it's comparing it to a man-made structure. This Hard outer shell provides the rigid framework for support, and then this trabecular grid work. It's not just randomly laid down. It is all laid down mathematically in response to the loading patterns that the bone has undergone. And it provides the support to the bone much the same way that all the struts do in a bridge. The stronger the struts, the stronger the bridge. The thicker and better this trabecular bone, more integral it is, the stronger is the bone itself. The third way that our body can absorb energy is through deform the deformation of the cartilage. Cartilage is found at the end of all of the long bones. If you're a meat eater and you've eaten chicken, you've seen that shiny little material at the end of the bones, that's the cartilage. It gets compressed. When the bones are pulled together, either from the loading or from the pull of muscle, that uh, cartilage gets compressed, and it's a tremendous shock absorber. Engineers have never come up with a material that is as good a shock absorber as is human cartilage. The problem is that human cartilage is so thin, it has poor blood supply. Once it's damaged, it can't be rebuilt. So if we look at our three ways of absorbing energy, we have eccentric muscle activity. Our muscles, and I gave that a big check mark, that's what we want to use. The more energy that we can absorb with our muscles, the safer that we are. Bone microfracture, that also gets a check mark, not quite as big as the eccentric muscle activity, because we want to induce some microfractures to our bones. That's part of the process that stimulates our bones to make themselves stronger and prevents diseases such as osteoporosis. Cartilage deformation gets a big X. We don't want loading of the cartilage because it cannot rebuild itself. And when your cartilage goes, that's a very debilitating situation. So in response to that, biomechanists, when they first saw the ground reaction forces of people rear foot running, and they go, there's lots of running injuries, there's that very big force, and much of their attention initially was focused on what can we do to get rid of that. That, was started, that th thought process occurred 40 years ago, and that thought process is still here now. Here, if we look at somebody as their forefoot or midfoot mid running, and you can see this person as they contact the ground, that their heel never really comes down and touches the ground at all. They land on the outside portion of their foot. What happens to the ground reaction force? That impact transient disappears. And so that is the basis right now of why there's a lot of talking about changing your running style. The, webs the websites, the internet is filled with this. There's articles in Runner's World about switching to becoming a midfoot runner because everybody's focused, ooh, we have less loading. 
But if we look at these two side by side, we'll see one thing that we'll notice is if you look at this second peak, this other force here, you'll see that it really doesn't change much. We have this mechanical phenomenon of a body coming down and contacting the ground that's got to be stopped from falling downwards and propelled back upwards. And mechanically, if you go through some of Newton's equations of motion, you see that that total force that's applied upward on the body has to be very, very similar. We can mess around with some of the characteristics, and if we change the way that we run, we can get rid of this impact peak, but there's not all that much focus in terms of how that changes the overall loading of the body. Because as it was written a long time ago, measuring ground reaction forces is one thing. We put a force platform on, you can have a person perform any activity, we can measure those forces. But that is just one of the forces that's acting on the body. That's just one of the forces and it's probably the least involved with the risk of injury. Going from measuring the ground reaction forces and modeling the body so that we can get in there and estimate or measure the force on the internal structures, the portions of the body that are actually getting injured, that's a completely different thing and that's where the sophistication and elegance of biomechanical modeling comes into play. That's been a challenge for the past 30 years and it's going to be a challenge for the next 30 years as we improve that modeling. But you see the, the, the general statement of if you change from rear foot to forefoot running you reduce the loading on the body. But that's a big oversimplification of the situation. So let's briefly let's look at the effect of the ground reaction force on the foot and then we'll try to take it all the way up, up the leg. Here's a couple skeletons out for a run. What this person is a rear foot lander. You can see that the contact with the ground is with their, their heel. There's the vertical ground reaction force. And you can see that it's behind what I've marked as your ankle axis. The axis of your, of your ankle goes through that bony prominence on the outside. Technically your lateral malleolus. When somebody's running forefoot, we have the ground reaction force and you can see that that's in front of the ankle joint. I'll just do a little demonstration, give you folks a chance to get it. Whoever wants to stand up for a second here. Everybody wants to do this, do a little bit of loading. Stand up on one foot and hold your choice of foot out in front of you, sort of curl it upwards. That's the shape, that's the position of your foot as you're coming down to ground. And just fall forward onto the, and land on the outside portion of your heel. What do you feel happened to your foot? It gets slapped down. You can hear it. If you do it vigorously enough, you can hear your foot slap into the ground. Where do you feel that contact in your leg? What muscles? You feel on the quadriceps up here, but down in your lower leg, what, what, what do you feel happening to resist that? You feel a little bit of muscle tension developing in here. That's the eccentric activity of those muscles. Now, put your toes into a toes pointed position as if you're landing forefoot and do the same thing, fall forward. Now where do you feel it? Feel it those, and you feel it on the, the gastrocnemius and soleus. We've got a whole different loading pattern. Our muscles respond completely different when you're running rear foot or forefoot. That's enough for standing up for now. So let's look at that from a mechanical sense. When a force is applied to a body and it causes it to rotate, we call that torque. So here we look at the rear foot person landing and that ground reaction force is applied behind the ankle joint and it causes your foot to slap downward, rotate in this case in the clockwise direction. When you're running forefoot and the ground reaction force is in front of your ankle, it wants to cause a torque, cause a turning effect to rotate your foot so that the top of your foot comes up towards your shank. So now let's go back and look at our good friend, those muscles down here on your, your shank. These muscles, your tibialis anterior being the dominant one of them on the front of the outside of your shank, we can simplify that. We say that although they've come down and they distribute it all over your foot, we can represent them for these purposes mechanically as a single force that's pulling upwards on the front of your foot. These muscles create a torque that causes your foot to rotate this way to go into dorsiflexion, bringing the top surface of your foot up closer to your shank. Your gastrocnemius and soleus, on the other hand, these are muscles that are behind the ankle joint, 
when they pull, they cause your leg to point your toes down. So if we're looking at the forces that are acting around the ankle joint, we've got this ground reaction force that wants to cause some rotation, and we need to counter that with muscle activity. So putting the person in the position, there's the ground reaction force behind the ankle joint, there's the ground reaction force in front of the ankle joint, forefoot landing. We need to, so that when we're running, if you're running rear foot, you don't feel your feet slapping along the ground. Every time your foot, your heel hits the ground, these muscles on the front of your shank are active to control the motion of your foot. Technically, it goes beyond just controlling the slapping down. You'll also notice if you land on the outside of your heel, it wants to cause your foot to roll inward more rapidly, that action of pronation. That's controlled also by all these muscles that pull on the front of your foot. When you land a, in a, a forefoot running technique, it's loading to the gastrocnemius and soleus. So we have two different loading patterns going on. It's not just a matter of the forces are changing, but we're loading different muscles in different patterns. And that brings us to our overall idea, good old leverage. Technically, this little butterfly, if he had a long enough lever arm, if this portion of the teeter-totter went out far enough, the weight of this butterfly could control the weight of this great big rhinoceros if he was on a short one. The benefits of leverage. That's what our body is. It's a system of levers. External forces applied that want to cause some rotation and our muscles that are offset from that axis that want to control rotation. So our muscles create torque, and while they're creating the torque, they're pulling on the attachment site. Tibialis anterior and that group of muscles pulling down on the front outer side portion of your, uh, of your lower leg, and the gastrocnemius and soleus pulling on the back of your leg and up across the knee joint. It's this balance of the muscle force creating torques and the ground reaction forces producing torques that is the real source of loading onto the body. Here's where it gets really interesting. Our muscles are activated by our central nervous system that sends little electrical signals down telling them to develop tension. But if we look at when somebody's running and their foot's in contact with the ground for less than a quarter of a second, our body doesn't wait until it needs force. It anticipates how much force is going to be done, and these muscle signals are sent out to activate the muscles beforehand. So this is a tracing showing when muscles are active while somebody's running, and the critical part here is there's where somebody's foot contacts the ground. This is during the swing phase, and if we look at those muscles, the anterior tibialis, the gastrocnemius, and soleus, even up to your quadriceps, you can see that the firing of these muscles is determined before you hit the ground. In essence, what our body's got going on here is a guessing game. You're running along, you're going to contact the ground, there's going to be this force that gets up to two times your body weight that needs to be dealt with. Your muscles are what's going to anticipate that, and your central nervous system sends signals down to it and says, fire, produce this much force but it really it doesn't know exactly how big the torque it needs to create. It's a guessing game. And there's a lot of, lot of possibility here for a little bit of misfire. Maybe it produced more force than it needed. Maybe it produced a little less force. Maybe you didn't land exactly where you thought you were going to land on your foot, and so the torques are different than what the central nervous system had anticipated. That's been a big focus of research for 40 years as it relates to loading of the body and people's risk of diseases such as osteoarthritis. It's this pre-firing that's very important. So here's a beauty of a slide. How many more lines can you get onto one slide? What this shows is the joint torques. The joint torques. This is the estimation of what your muscles are doing when somebody is running. This is somebody who's running landing on their heel. They're we have their ankle torque, their knee torque, and their hip torque. And this shows 
with increasing speeds from three and a half meters per second up to almost nine meters per second. Very slow to very fast. And what do you see happening with the torques of the joints? They get bigger at the ankle. They get bigger at the knee. Since the primary role of the hip joint is to stabilize your trunk up there and do a little bit of driving, there's not as dramatic a change in the hip joint as there is in the ankle joint. But the take home from this is that as you run faster, the muscles are being called on to produce greater torques. There's greater loading of the system from these muscles that are controlling and producing the movement. If we compare what's going on with the torques in rear foot and forefoot, some recent study that came out, and we see here the forefoot are these, somebody running forefoot at their ankle is the solid line, and rear foot are these dash lines. There's a significant difference in the amount of torque at the ankle and at the knee joint and at the hip joint when you run forefoot or rear foot. When you run landing rear foot, the torque is less at the ankle joint. Your muscles have to produce less torque at the ankle than they do if you run forefoot. But up at the knee joint, since our joints work synchronized to produce this energy absorption, when you run rear foot, I one too many Fs here, when you run uh, rear foot, there is greater torque in the rear foot motion than there is in the forefoot motion. So it's not just a difference in these ground reaction force patterns, it's a completely different loading of muscles and it's a different, complete, completely different loading of all the joints of the body as you change from rear foot to forefoot. Then we get to the energy absorption aspect and here's where modeling comes into play. If we combine the motion of the joint and we count take into account the torques that are being created, we can calculate the amount of energy that is being absorbed by individual joints. We measure the joint power, and then we take, measure the area under the curve, and that gives us work. So what we're interested in energy absorption are these two phases. Negative power means that the muscles are absorbing energy, and positive power means that they're generating energy. If we compare the forefoot runner, the, again, the dark line, to the rear foot runner, you can see an obvious difference in the amount of energy that, that's being absorbed. When somebody is running um, on their forefoot, they absorb more energy than when at their ankle joint than when they're running rear foot. The same thing is at, happens at the knee joint. When somebody's running with, uh, with a rear foot pattern, they call on their knees to absorb more energy than they do if they're running in forefoot. So we can summarize these two pretty complex curves into this easier to read pie diagram that shows a distribution. If you take the total amount of energy that is absorbed by a leg while somebody is running, and then you look at the individual contributions of the ankle, the knee, and the hip joint, and then we can present it in this nice three color, color graph. Looking at energy absorption, somebody running rear foot versus forefoot. When you run rear foot, we can see that there's about an equal amount of energy absorption between the ankle and the knee joint. We're calling on two joints to be our primary energy absorbers. When you run forefoot, you can see that there's a change. The knee now accounts for almost two thirds of all of the energy that's absorbed by the lower extremity. The knee is not as much, a, much of an energy absorber. If we look at the generation as you're pushing off, Again, we can see that there's differences between rear foot and running. Our ankle is the primary generator of the push-off when you're running forefoot, where uh, and it produces more of the energy push-off than when you're running with the rear foot motion. The bottom line of all of this is if we look at the actual loading across the joints, we can see that there are doesn't take a big statistical analysis to see that these curves look different. There's a different load when somebody runs rear foot. Your body is loaded at different points throughout the range of motion and it's loaded at different magnitudes throughout the range of motion when you run rear foot versus forefoot. And those differences are obvious all the way up to the hip. 
It completely changes what we're asking the leg to do. So at this point, we can put into some running really loads the body. We're talking about magnitudes of loading just from ground reaction forces, about two times body weight. When we get into the actual loads across the joints, it's up to five times body weight. And that's all dynamic loading. That's not just coming from the ground reaction force, but it's our muscles' response and our muscles' anticipation of these forces. Each step is variable. It's not like we have a consistent pattern. We're not robots. We're not an automobile engine that consistently generates this power output. Every step is different. It's more than just the ground reaction force that creates the load. The mus muscle response is actually the primary contributor to it. The load gets greater as you run at faster speeds. The loading pattern is different at each joint. It's not that the ankle, the knee, and the hip are all exposed to the same type of loads. That varies considerably, and the loading pattern differs as you make changes in your rutting pattern. What's all this mean? What's the, the, the bottom line of all this? Well, if we go to three overriding principles of training that are basically the way to evaluate the effectiveness of any training program, in fact, we can switch it to four because we want to stay injury free. If we're injured, we're not being able to train. Overload, progressive resistance, and specificity. A well, picture's worth a thousand words, so we'll show this up here. If we plot fitness level along the vertical axis, how trained somebody is, and then we look at the horizontal axis as training load. This is a low load, and this is a high load out here. This is low fitness, this is high fitness. If we look at a beginner, and there is their train level in this dark rectangle. The old overload principle, as many of you are probably familiar with, tells you that if you want to get a training effect, then you have to load a tissue above the level that it's already adapted to. To increase your strength, you increase the load that you impose. To increase your cardiovascular endurance, you increase the load. We call that a stimulating load, and this shows that for a beginner, this, this level of load, what they've ad adapted to, if they go over here, if they overload, and they gradually increase that stimulating load, they get a training effect. As all of you are aware, though, it works the opposite way. We can have a detraining effect that occurs. If you've adapted to this particular level of load and you stop being physically active, then the body starts to lose its fitness level. It starts to decrease. Progressive resistance tells us that because these adaptations are occurring, as you've been loading the body, as it gets stronger, as it gets fitter, to it now impose an overload, you need to raise your training load. So here's our beginner, and here's the, that individual when they become trained. What used to constitute a stimulating load is now the load to which their body's adapted to. Their bones have gotten stronger, their muscles have gotten stronger, their cardiovascular fitness has increased. That's their new retaining load. For them to induce a training effect, they have to train at an even higher level. They have to produce a new load that stimulates the body to respond. They're still not immune to the detraining load. If they stop to train at this, if they stop training at this level, then their fitness is gonna decrease back. So ideally, for improved fitness, it's systematically applying the overload and watching as the body increases its fitness level. Specificity tells us that the adaptation occurs in the tissues loaded. If you use this term, fitness level, but the reality of it is you have a fitness level for your muscles. You have a fitness level for individual muscles. You have a fitness level for bones. You have a fitness level for every individual tissue. And specificity tells us that the adaptation, the changes, the training effect occurs specifically to those tissues that have been loaded. And it also adapts specifically to the magnitude, the rate of loading that you've imposed on it, the magnitude, the speed at which you've been training, the range of motion you've used, and the duration. It's not an overall improvement. If you train your cardiovascular, you're not necessarily going to increase your speed because there's different tissues that contribute to that. 
So it's a pretty simple concept of progressive resistance, overload, and specificity. But the complexity as it comes to the body is what makes it so difficult for injury prevention and for inducing universal training. So let's look a little bit at this. Our loading induces the training effect. That's the stimulus to cause the training effect. But we also know that injuries occur from it. So what's the difference between a training effect and injury? And the bottom line is not much. We know that there's two different types of injuries. We talk of two different types of injuries that can occur. And it's related to, one, how big the force is, how big the stress is that's imposed, and two, the number of times that, that stress is imposed. So here's a number of repetitions going from a single application of a level of stress to many applications of a level of stress. And on the stress portion, we have very low level of loading to very high level of loadings. loading. And there's various combinations of stress magnitude and number of times it's applied that can cause an injury. For example, we can get a traumatic injury. If you're running down the street and you land on your ankle badly and you twist your ankle, there's a single identifiable event that caused the injury. That's referred to as a traumatic injury, a single application of a very high level of force that exceeds the body's ability to withstand it. However, if we come out here, we get the bane of people who are involved in physical activity. You get into the overuse injuries. In the industrial settings, it's known as cumulative trauma injury, where you have multiple applications of a lower level of stress. Any time you exceed this combination of repetitions and magnitude that falls up here, you can get into an overuse injury. It's a pretty simple idea, but what's very difficult is identifying what exactly is this threshold, since all of our tissues respond differently. What, what will induce a training effect, and you'll get beneficial things occurring in muscles, can lead to a problem within bones or other tissues. So we're still not to the difference between what's the difference between training and injury. So we go back to a paper from about 30, about 20 years ago from Keith Williams, who was a, still is a big time researcher running, where he came up with a simple model of it. We increase our training effort. Increase our training effort, and we get greater loading onto the body and tissue, greater stress on the body. That causes the microfractures and the breakdowns within the tissue. Our body is a biological material that responds to that well and it makes stronger bones, makes stronger muscles. Tissue remodeling occurs. So in Williams' model, what happens is that if the rate of remodeling, if the body is given adequate time to rebuild this, before you impose that same load, before you go back and re-damage those tissues, then the remodeling is good. We get a stronger tissue. And in, because we have stronger tissues, now we can further increase our training loads. Everything's well and good. But if the rate of remodeling, if how quickly the body rebuilds itself, if it doesn't rebuild that tissue before you impose that load on it again, that's bad. That's what leads to overuse injuries. You've got a tissue that's still residually damaged from the last loading event, and then you damage it again. So it never completely heals itself. Once you get an overuse injury, something that interferes with your training, you decrease your training effect, and you get the tissue remodeling. But in this case, you get the tissue remodeling that lowers your fitness level. So when it comes down to it, what's the difference between training an injury is time, making sure that you provide the right amount of time. We have some rule of thumbs. Take hard days, take easy days, take 48 hours between training sessions. Those are all rule of thumbs. People still get injured in spite of those rules. So we can look at, well, what are some of these common training mistakes that lead to injuries? And really, there's not just one common training mistake. It falls under the rule of too much too soon. We push ourselves too hard. Looking at these more specifically, one is that we try to increase our speed 
too quickly. Speed completely changes the load, and you're still running, you're still running on the same road, you're but you've got a completely different loading pattern. Your body needs time to adapt to that. If you run farther, you've repeated that loading, that no, a number of incidents, times that you've applied that load, your body needs additional time to recover. If you run more frequently during the week, oh, if training once a day is good, I'm gonna train twice a day. Well, that's additional loading to the body. You change, make a change in the terrain or the surface. Your body now is anticipating, has to adapt with a different loading pattern. That's going to change the loading across different tissues. Something as simple as changing from concrete to asphalt to sand to wood chips to a track surface. That changes the loading that's imposed on the body. A shoe change. You go out and you buy a brand new pair of shoes. Oh, these feel so comfortable. You go out and do the same pattern you did the last time. Shoes it affect the interface between your foot and the ground, that changes the loading. Setting unrealistic goals. This is one of the biggest problems. The health benefits come from being regularly physically active, not by getting to a particular fitness level. And you get people, I want to run a marathon in two months or three weeks, and they set up an unrealistic training program. People say, I want to lose 30 pounds in a month. They set an unrealistic goal and they push themselves too hard. Most of those people are injured before they've had any substantial or rewarding weight gain if they're after some aesthetic benefit from it. Running when you're tired. When your muscles are fatigued and they're no longer capable of controlling those tissues to the same, you get a whole different response throughout your musculoskeletal system in terms of the microtrauma that's been done. So bottom line from this, don't make big changes in a single session. Don't come from saying, oh, okay, I'm going to run seven and a half minute miles today. I'm going to run six and a half minute miles. That's a completely different load. You can probably do that, but make sure that you provide yourself with the adequate rest after that, additional time to recovery. Your muscles are going to feel good because your muscles recover very quickly, but it's those loading sites where the muscles attach, the microscopic damage within the bones, that takes longer to heal. And the loading across your joints isn't as fast as what happens in your muscles and in your bones. Don't make changes too soon. Don't radically change your program. Big change, go faster, longer in a particular session. And don't say, well, okay, by next week, I want to be running twice as far. Your body can probably do that, but you're going to be dealing with some pain that cumulatively over time is almost guaranteed that it's going to interfere with your training program. So along with these lines, this idea of training through pain, if there's a stupider idea out there as it relates to fitness, I don't know what it is. Because when you suffer pain in a joint, and the obvious thing, if you, if you sprain your ankle or your knee joint and you start limping, that makes dramatic changes in how the stress is distributed over the joints of your body. Mike Ditka is a perfect example of this. Iron Mike dislocated his foot, as they called it in the 1960s, goes right back to full-time training, starts developing pain in his hip, continues to run right through all of that and play football, starts developing pain in his other side, and eventually has two hip replacement surgeries that all resulted from the adaptations and being an Iron Man and running through the pain. When you take on this new movement pattern, stress gets distributed in a different way, and those new tissues are very, very susceptible to being injured. It may take a little bit of time, but it's almost guaranteed that they're going to be injured. Ignore the example of those who sit, do run through pain. When I went back and I showed that success in running comes from motivation, successful runners are not normal people. <laughs> you just need to read through Runner's World magazine where they're telling people how, oh, I was painful, but I I just kept going through it and I dealt with all that pain. But if you go to the scientific literature, runners like to run not till it's intolerable. They have such a high pain tolerance, they will run when normal people would have stopped a long time ago. They run when it actually inter stop running when it interferes with their training. When they do go to a clinic, injury history, as it's reported in the scientific literature, 
They reported an initial injury. I started to feel a little pain on the outside of my right leg, but I thought I could run through it. So they ran through it. And then they started getting pain on the other side. And eventually, the combination of these two pains causes them to miss a day and they go to see somebody. They probably should have made the adaptations when they've got the first pain, but they wait until it's gone much more advanced and they have a longer recovery time. Read the list of injuries that are suffered by high-level athletes and then ask yourself, would you have been willing to go through with that? Rapid returns from super, very, very bad sprained ankles, all sorts of injuries that would knock most of us out. So just finish a little bit, I know many of you are assuming that many of you might be running the marathon tomorrow. A little bit about the transition from uh, biking to running, to the scientific definition of the last kilometer of biking, first kilometer of running, and the switch over interval. Uh, we know that when people uh, in biking, there's no eccentric activity. Your muscles are always developing tension and causing the joint motion. Even as your leg comes back up, it's not being loaded eccentrically. There's no impact when you're on a bicycle. There's more load on your shoulders from supporting your upper body than when you're running. There's more wind resistance, which helps cool you down a bit. But you've got an awful, a terrible back position. If we look at somebody in a typical cycling position, you can see that they're leaned over. Again, if OSHA came in and said this, if you were going to make a worker assume this position, you would be liable for a big trouble. You can't force people to go into that position. Our back has a natural arch to it, and that is the basis of back health. So when you make the transition <coughs> from biking to running, one is this is something that if you're going to be a regular triathlete, it's something that you should practice on a regular basis. So, since there's no eccentric in when you're, when you're biking, in your transition, take a little bit more time. I don't think anybody in here is necessarily going to come in first or third through their age group. So you can add a little bit, a few more seconds onto your time. Do a few deep and deep bends. That's eccentrically controlled. It gets your muscles back to it in a more controlled function. Do a little bit of bouncing in place. Just get your body used to that impact that's going to encounter for the run that follows. You have some less... There's going to, you have the awkward position of shoulders. Make sure that you do some shoulder loosening up exercises. There's less wind resistance. Wind resistance can be beneficial and helps you cool it. So make sure that you drink lots of water at the transition and then during the run itself. And most importantly for your low back, do what's referred to as the McKenzie exercises before and after you change shoes. Whatever you do, don't do this. This exacerbates the problem. It's not uncommon to see people at the transition or working out and reaching down and touching your toes. In fact, many fitness tests still evaluate flexibility by can, can you touch your toes? Or even this position where you roll back and bring your knees up to your hip. What this does is it takes out that curve out of your low back. It exacerbates the problem. What you want to do are these McKenzie exercises. And if there's one take-home lesson from this that you can use even in your everyday lex lesson, Rob McKenzie was a physical therapist who posed this idea. The argument is much of our back pain comes from this rounded position that we're in so often. And so here's a McKenzie exercise by somebody in exercise clothes. Spread your feet out comfortably, tighten your butt together, and just lean back. That emphasizes that lumbar curve. There's the McKenzie exercises by, done by somebody who's been working at a computer terminal for 20 minutes. They should get up. Their low back pain can have the same type of a source. And the reason for that, you get into the mechanics of your low back, that interaction between adjacent vertebrae, the bones of your back, and the intervertebral disc. Your intervertebral disc is like a big jelly donut. When you squeeze it, when you lean on it, it pushes the soft inner material in the opposite direction. When you lean forward, when you assume this rounded back position, the front of your vertebra is squeezed together and it pushes the jelly inside your, the nucleus pulposus backwards. If that disc pops, there's your low back pain. That bulging nerve, that bulging disc will push onto the nerve and the pain will radiate throughout the body. 
The McKenzie exercises, on the other hand, what it does is it squeezes it and it forces that disc back to its normal alignment. So there's the most important take-home lesson that you can use even on days when you're not training is taking care of your low back. So where we've been, I did a very quick overview of the biomechanics of running with some pretty advanced graphs here, the kinematics with a special focus on the kinetics because it's the loading of the body that's critically important. Anytime that people talk to you about, oh, changing your form this way, you need to look that the change of form that you use is a reflection of the loads on your body. And we talked about consideration of the, this, the importance of this loading in training program design and preventing injuries and in making the body health, more healthy. So. Thank you very much for your attention.